Good morning to you all. Um, thank you for your present here. And uh, this is coming from Bentley Education. Bentley, uh, this is uh, actually a webinar on innovation. Uh, every once in a while, a new technology, an old problem, and a big idea turn into an innovation. So we are talking about an innovation today and an inspiration to innovation. And, uh, uh, you know, creativity is thinking of new things. Innovation is doing new things. So today we have in our presence the privilege of two of those people who could creatively think and have also done very, very innovative thinking, which has put the benchmark much, much higher in, in, the, in the British digital space. So let me present to you the two of those uh, speakers today. Um, we have Alexandra Bolton. Uh, thank you so much for your time, Alexandra Bolton. Alexandra Bolton is the former so executive director, director of, of the, the Center, Center for Digital Wealth Britain, where she founded ran and, and grew, grew this unique socio technical change, change program, home, home to the UK's building information modeling, and they, and they also built the national digital twin, the global big program. program. Center for Digitally Based Britain brought industry, government, and academia together, and that is the context today about one of the reasons why we are targeting the academia is about how do we bring the industry and academia to creatively think and innovatively work on. Alexandra is the former deputy head of the National Digital Twin Program and an ambitious UK program to enable an ecosystem of connected digital twin across the built environment. She is, she is contributing to the national report in the UK's cyber physical infrastructure. Alexandra had had a very career, having qualified as a chemical engineer, working in industry and the city before rejoining the University of Cambridge in 2014. She is currently an independent consultant providing strategic advice on digital transformation, digital twins, and organizational strategies. What, what a great privilege to have her with us, and uh, she's, she's going to be sharing, sharing her wisdom and experience for the next 20 minutes time. Thank you so much, Alexandra. Alexandra. We, we also have with us today, with us today an, eminent, an, eminent, an eminent eminent person from the game, a part of the digital independent, Mark Holtz. Thank you, Mark. Mark, Mark is a Bentley International, International Director for Public, Public Policy and Advocacy. And advocacy. Where, where he, he helped to inform and guide, and guide the government, the government policy makers, makers, business, business leaders, leaders, and decision, and decision makers globally on, on the benefits of digital, digital transformation. In the last one week, I've been traveling with Mark. Mark. Uh, one, one of the, of the creative questions what he put across in Australia is that why, why is that we still do not have a national approach to a digital twin? So I can understand where does the creativity and innovation come from? Your former, Your former quantity, quantity surveyor with an extensive background in global, global project, project delivery. Mark, Mark first began, began working in the construction, construction sector 33 years ago. So, so I'm, sure I'm sure many of my audience will not, not be even 33 years So his experience is possibly in the age of many of the audience students not targeting Mark. He has worked with Thames Water, United Utilities, ICI, Highways England, the Olympic, the Olympic Delivery, Delivery Authority, Authority and, and the most, the most important three, the cross rail, rail, which at that, at that point, point of time was the, the, the largest capital invested, invested project in the UK. UK and he was, he was a part, a part of that. So, so if you look at cross section of it, utility, uh, uh, process company, company, and then Olympic, Olympic event, and, event and, and cross, cross rail. rail. So the past the 10 years, Mark has been working in digital transformation and has seen the great advances made in the sector by adopting digital ways of working. He worked, worked on, on numerous infrastructure, infrastructure projects, consulting, consulting asset owners, and their advisor, advisor on technology adoption to attain better project results result while being conscious of time, cost, and quantity. Presently, Presently Mark, Mark is also under the segment of Centre for Digital Rebuild Britain, when he is the industry, where he is the industry lead for the digital twin hub, an integral part of the national digital twin program, and that is one of the. Uh, what, uh, what is the vision? What, what, what Bentley Education has today is about setting up a digital, digital hub here, here nationally. nationally. So, so let's listen, let's to, listen both to both of them. them. So, so, so let's get the, get the ball rolling with the Alexander. Alexander. Over what do you have? Thank you. Thank you very much, Sri. And and it's a real pleasure to be here. Thank you. Thank you for everybody who's who's dialed in to listen. So I want to tell you a little bit about the Centre for Digital Built Britain, and then our vision, a bit about digital transformation, then a little bit about the opportunities that I see 
um, in the industry. Thank you, Mark. So um, try to talk how data and digital twins can shape a better future. And that's for the planet, it's for your company, and it's for you. So CDBB was set up in 2017. It was a partnership between our Department of Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy and the University of Cambridge. But it was much more than just that. It was about bringing industry, government and academia together to build a digital built environment that improves quality of life for everybody. Its initial remit was to build academic capacity to inform policy and to support industry's change. But it grew very quickly and developed into a multi programme partnership to deliver information management across the entire built environment, everywhere from um, discovery, so research in and outside of academia at TRL's level three, four, five and onwards, through to full industry delivery and adoption. And it was the first in, certainly in the UK, to have that remit. We started, as I said, as a partnership between Bayes and the University of Cambridge. And we immediately picked up the UK's Digital Built Britain programme, looking at the digital transformation of the infrastructure sector, and the UK's BIM, Building Information Modelling programme. We also ran the National Digital Twin programme from 2018 onwards. Indeed, we were set up by our National Infrastructure Commission to do so. We are one of the three partners for the Construction Innovation Hub, and we held the digital part of that. And the International BIM programme ran from CDBB taking BIM to countries who perhaps hadn't thought about adopting BIM as a way of meeting their sustainability and ESG goals. One of the most important things I think that CDBB did was they looked at what is the vision for the built environment. So historically we've talked about single assets, so building or a road or a water treatment plant, but we've not thought about the built environment as a thing in itself, as a system of systems which of course it is. So we brought together 75 industry leaders from 45 different organisations and we asked them to think about what is your vision for the built environment? And that's not predicting what the future will be, it's about saying what we want the future to be and how we're going to get there. And they came up with this, that the built environment has an explicit purpose, we need to think of it as a whole, and its explicit purpose is to enable people and the planet to flourish together for generations. Sounds really simple, but actually when you move your focus away from thinking about the thing that you're building or the thing that you're running to what are the outcomes it creates, it completely changes the way you manage it, you think about it, you design it. This group of leaders came up with the fact that it's the outcomes that are enabled for the important thing rather than just the building. We need, know we need to get more from less as we go forward, so we need to think about what are the outcomes that we want and how we're going to get there. They also pointed out that the built environment is a system of systems, all of which are interconnected and very complex, but that they're essential for our well-being. And they pointed out that it's not just about the physical that we see, it's actually the services that are enabled by the people and the physical assets that are the things that create those outcomes that we want. I should add here that there are um, links on all the slides to the documents which are free and uh, easy to download. Please do take a look at them. So why was the vision important? Well, if you look at the number of people who have lived on the planet in the last 50,000 years, it's about 100 billion. That's a lot of people. We've got about 8 billion of us on the planet at the moment. But if you project for, for, forwards for the next 50,000 years, you're talking about 6.75 trillion people. Now we on the planet at the moment, we're the ancestors for those people and the decisions we make today will affect their lives or even if they have a life. When we look at the events of the last three or so years, it, it's been like nothing I remember in my lifetime. In the UK, we've just come, we're still in the biggest drought for 500 years. In Australia, Australia I've seen bushfires like never before. I've seen floods. We have our fragile ecosystems that we need to make sure that we protect and manage appropriately. We're becoming far more urbanised and there are simply more of us. We're having more frequent extreme weather events. We know we need to look at new sources of power. And of course, there's been the pandemic and there will be another pandemic at some time, whether it's in a year's time or 100 years time or 500 years time. So we need to think about how will we manage that? How do we manage the 
the challenges that are left after this pandemic, how do we make sure that our health systems run well? Many of us are now working from home or working on hybrid. How do we do that? What, what do we need to do to make that work well, to make both work and living accessible for those of all abilities? So these are the big, some of the big challenges that we, that we face currently. We need to make better decisions. We need to make those better decisions for better outcomes. Professor Sir David King said in 2017 that the decisions we make in the next 10 years will affect the, will determine the outcome for humanity for the next 10,000. So there's a lot resting on our shoulders. We need to make the right choices for the right futures. And we can do that through data-driven decisions. It won't happen accidentally. We need to do that purposefully, intentionally, looking at the outcomes that we want to create. If we do that, we can create that future that we would like to see. When you're talking about data, this sums it up. If you want to get it right, you need to make sure that you have the right data at the right time, in the right hands, and that data is right. Sounds super simple, and I just put it up on a slide, but I was in a room of practitioners recently, and the wry smiles on their faces when I put this up tell me exactly what I already knew. This is much easier to say than it is to do. So what do I mean when I say that? Well, at CDBB, we worked on data throughout the life cycle of an asset. At the beginning, before you even pick up your mouse or your pen, you need to think about who needs the data. Not now, not in the next year, but through the whole life cycle of the asset. What format do they need it in? When do they need it? How do they need it? How much of it do they need? How do you make that secure right from the very beginning? And once you've done that, once you've got your design in place, you need to think about the building, the constructing. How are you going to do that? Who needs the data and when? Let's make sure that people have the data before they need it, that it's shared appropriately so everybody in the supply chain has access to the data and the information that they need to do their jobs. When we do that, we can make the construction phase safer, higher quality and much more productive. And that's what we all want to see. And historically, we've been pretty good at that. Not perfect, but pretty good. But we've collected all that data together and put it in a book or on a USB stick or a drive with the keys on top and we've handed that over to the owner operator of the building or the road or the treatment plant. That's not good enough anymore. We need to make sure that we hand over something that's fully interoperable, that they can use it. And actually, ideally, that it's a model or a digital twin that's currently working so they can pick it up, they can run with it. They can add data that they collect as they're using the building. So, for example, monitoring the lifts to see when it might need maintaining and doing that maintenance at a weekend when people aren't in the building. We need to make sure that we're getting data from a variety of sources, so sensors on the building, from satellites, for example, and from the phones that we carry around with us. And we need to use that to transform the performance of the building and the efficiency. And not just the building, but of the services that it delivers. Because as I said, it's the services that create those outcomes. And then we need to integrate that building or that asset into its environment. We need to make sure that it's getting data from the assets that are around it. So other buildings, road systems, transport systems, to make sure that we're operating that building efficiently in itself and within that ecosystem. And we need to make sure that that data is used for the citizen to make sure that their quality of lives are improved. And at each stage of this, the design, build, operate and integrate, we need to put the lessons that we've learned and we need to feed it back to the earlier stages so that next time we design, build or operate something, we do it much better. The built environment is a system of systems. We have our in economic infrastructure. So I'm talking power plants, factories, water plants, transport systems, our social infrastructure, the places that we live, work, play, hospitals, schools, houses, and our natural environment, not just in the city, but beyond in the agricultural regions and the wild natural regions. If you put all those together, that's your built environment. And we need to look not just at what we're building today. If you look at this picture, you can see that while the design, build, commissioning, decommissioning is there, it's that small circle on the left, on the right even, by the crane. The huge amount of time, the huge amount of money, the huge amount of use is in the operation and maintenance stage. So we need to make sure that we have the data available to make sure that we optimise that make sure that we have a really good experience of the people who are living, working, using those things. And I've spoken about the physical built environment, but each piece of that is creating data, whether it is from sensors, phones, satellites, that data is loaded up into a virtual world, a cyber world, if you like, where we can look at it, we can run models and simulations and gain insights. 
And from those, we can make better decisions driven by the data. Those decisions can be actioned through interventions into the physical world. And that link from the physical with data up to the cyber, the cyber with interventions back to the physical, that's the cyber physical system that is the true built environment. Let's talk a little bit about digital twins. So some of you may watch Formula One. I'm a bit of a Formula One nut. And you've seen them driving their fantastic, super complex cars. What you may or may not know is that they also have an equally complex digital twin. All the data from the car and the driver and the track is loaded up to a virtual world. So data from the physical to the cyber, interventions from the cyber to the physical, and those interventions can be automated. So for example, tweaking the fuel air mix to make sure that it runs more efficiently, or they can be much more human focused. So it could be a call through to the driver to say, you really need to come in for a pit stop, your tires are about to go. So you gain insights, make decisions in the virtual world to create the outcomes that you want in the physical world. Now, there are many different sorts of digital twins for many different purposes, providing for us that you have a physical sending data to the digital with interventions back into the physical. That's the digital twin. They can be very complex or really very simple. They have a number of things in common. They must deliver value so that we can make better decisions more quickly. They don't have to be truly physical. They could be processes or systems. So we can look at the financial system or the flow of patients through a healthcare service. That could also be the physical in this sense, but it must deliver outcomes by data modeling and visualizations. And again, it doesn't have to be a visualization. It's a fantastic aid particularly for people who might not be technically trained, to see something in 3D and understand how it might feel. But it doesn't have to have a visualisation to be a digital twin. But all digital twins must be driven by purpose. You need to know why you're doing it and what you want the outcomes to be. So let's look at a digital twin of a train carriage. You've got your physical train carriage, you've got sensors perhaps in the carriage and on the wheels, putting data up into the cyber world gaining insights and decisions and interventions back in, which might be your wheels are running low, you really need to get it in for maintenance in the next couple of weeks, when will be convenient, or it might be it's just too hot, let's turn the aircon off. But let's not just think about the train. Of course, the signals and the track and the stations and the tunnels all have digital twins. How much more powerful is it if we connect these up, sharing data between these different aspects of the rail network to make better decisions? So we know that the track seven kilometers down is buckling due to the heat. We can take the appropriate action for the train and the signals to make sure that the, the problem's mitigated. But transport's not just about trains. Let's have an ecosystem of connected transport digital twins, bring in aviation, bring in road. In the UK, we've had some pretty big train strikes recently, and it has had a knock on effect, of course, on the road systems. But if we had had a connected ecosystem of digital twins across our whole transport network, we would have known where the pinch points might be and been able to take action to mitigate those. But again, it's not just about transport. Let's link that in with the power system and the water system. We can mitigate the effects of floods. We can know when the big load is likely to come from EVs and make sure we have the appropriate power production. This ecosystem of connected digital twins is what we start to call a national digital twin, but it could be a global digital twin or a city digital twin. Here's another way of looking at it. Here's your physical built environment that I've spoken about and your cyber world with a single digital twin, putting data up from the physical and actions, interventions down from the cyber to the physical. And there are lots of these throughout the built environment. But how much more powerful is that? How much better are our decisions if we link these up and have an ecosystem of connected digital twins? But it's not good enough to just think about the tech. You need to think about the values that underpin this. In 2018, CDBB produced the Gemini principles. And we've said that connected digital twins or digital twins or even just information management must have the following, it must have a purpose. You need to know why you're doing it. It's vital. For us, that's the public good. That doesn't mean there aren't imme immense and amazing commercial opportunities. There are. But the fundamental purpose must be to create public good in perpetuity. It's got to create value, financial value, social value and environmental value and it must be able to give us insights it has to be trustworthy and there's a little bit of tension in this line because it must be secure and it must be secure in itself and enable security but it must be as open as possible and it must be of suitable quality 
when you're talking about the data. But you can see that a very secure system might be extremely locked down and not at all open. A very open system might not be at all secure. So we need to find the balance for each digital twin, how much it sh data it shares and how it shares it to make sure that we've got that equilibrium. And the last thing is it absolutely has to function. It's got to work. It needs to be this fed federated model of an ecosystem of connected digital twins rather than one monolithic digital twin of everything. It has to be cur curated properly, clear governance, ownership, regulation and leadership. And I'll come back to leadership because it's absolutely vital. And it needs to be able to evolve. The tech, even over the five years I've been in CDBB, has changed beyond my imagination. In the next 10 years, we're going to have an increase, I think, in the evolution of technology. And we need to be very open in how we define our digital twins and our connected digital twins so that it can evolve as the tech evolves and as society evolves. There are many benefits of digital twins. For people, it's about getting better value for your tax dollar and actually better experience living, working, playing in places that work for us, that create the outcomes that we want. Profit comes in two senses. There are the very commercial profits when you're talking about new market entrants, new beneficiaries, new ways of working. But also on a national and an international level, increases of GDP, GDP because we have better infrastructure, better performing, working more efficiently. And benefits for the planet. We can protect those fragile ecosystems. We can make decisions to reduce pollution, to reduce waste, to increase reuse. CWB finished its mission in March this year, and we pulled together the Gemini papers. So it's a collection of papers that show everything that we've learned over the time that we were there. What are digital twins? Why do you need connected digital twins? And how you would enable a connected ecosystem? And what we've learned so far can be summarised that they must be outcome focused, as we spoke about, and purpose driven. It must be systems based because the built environment is this very complex system of systems and it needs to be values guided. And for us, that's absolutely the Gemini principles. But here's a bit that you might not expect me to say as an engineer. It needs to be socio-technical and it needs to be community enabled. So you have the technical, we've spoken about that, connected digital twins. But if you don't have the socio, so I'm talking about legal structures, I'm talking about privacy, I'm talking about making sure that people understand what's happening. I'm talking about changing ways of working and supporting people to do that, about skills and training. It is a socio-technical programme. In fact, it's actually a socio-technical change programme and we need to have a roadmap to know where we're going and we need to look at our theory of change to know how we're going to get there. And it's community able, enabled, both from the top down, from leadership, and again, I will speak more about that, and the bottom up to understand what's happening on the ground, what we need to do, what people, society want from these things. We use the phrase, let's collaborate on the rules and compete on the games. If we can agree the framework that we want to work in, just like we might agree the rules of Aussie football, for example, the rules are fixed, we all abide by those, and we can compete very hard on the field, abiding by those rules. There are a huge number of opportunities in this industry. This is just a few that I, I thought about last night as I was thinking about coming to talk here. It's not just about old school construction. It's not just about data management. There are all sorts of different aspects of this business that are emerging and really very exciting. You need digital skills, so you need to be able to look at the analytics and the intelligence. You need to be able to model data. You need to look at the life cycle through the whole of the asset life cycle and the quality management of the data. Obviously, there are data fundamentals that you need to look at, and you need to make sure that security and ethics are very involved. But then there are the business school skills. So you need to be very adaptable. We need to have transformational leadership and collaboration. Communication is vital. We need to be able to explain to people in non-technical terms, what we're doing, why we'll do it, and what the outcomes will be. You need a very strong commercial mindset, and you need to have some form of business analysis. And if you take one thing away from today, I'd like it to be this. Any form of information management, but particularly ecosystem of connected digital twins, need strong leadership, but not the sort of leadership that we might automatically think of. It's not about command and control. 
It's about convening, connecting and coordinating. It's about collaboration between leaders in the connected digital twin space. And those are leaders now and emerging leaders coming through. It's about recognising the sum of all the key work that's happening out there. And there's some incredible work. We've been in Australia for just over a week now, and I've been blown away by what we've seen. We need to link up all those amazing pieces of work happening to make that bigger, bigger sum. In short, it needs boundary spanning visionary leadership because we have to deliver a coherent and shared narrative and a shared roadmap if we're going to get that vision that we want, a better future for people and the planet. I've pulled together a list of resources. Please have a look at them and download them. They're all free. They're all without copyright. Just please reference that you pick them up from whichever group you pick them up from when you use them. Thank you so much. If you have any questions, please, now's the time to shout. Thank you so much, uh, Alexander. Um, uh, I have actually put together some questions before I open it up to the audience on so a couple of points in your presentation, what we talked about it, the digital skills and, and the opportunities and knowing that the, the audience for this today's program is predominantly from the uh, learning ecosystem, that is from the educators and students. So we believe that the the opportunities could be in the form of learning and research and, and creating thought leadership. So, so, so yeah. Since a larger audience of the webinar is from the academy, my first question is, we are excited to see the Digital Twin Hub established by CDDB is creating greater learning opportunities. In the last two weeks, we have also come across academy in Australia setting up digital hubs and BIMs. We saw one in Queensland and then we saw one in Canberra, right? So could you share your thoughts and wisdom on how do we make this hub generate a talent pipeline? So the hubs are a um, really useful way of connecting people, but there are many other ways of doing that as well. And I think we need to use all the opportunities that we have. So certainly in the UK, the digital twin hub is the voice of industry. There's academic involvement, but it, it's the industry voice. We have very strong networks between academic institutions um, held together by our, our national bodies. And I'm, I'm seeing that in Australia as well, different universities starting to work together in a collaborative sense. We need to, to leverage that. We need to make sure that more of our work is, or our research work is multi-institution and, and cross-discipline. Because this is something that not no one group, no one person, no one country can do. We can only do it if we work together. Okay, the, the bit I'd add to that as well is, is the communication aspect. Now you have so many organizations and uh, I'll, I'll keep it very, very simple. The, you know, you, you know, particularly you have institutions that may specialise in road. You may have institutions that specialise in rail, and you have in institutions that specialise in utilities or water power. You know, they cannot work independently of each other. They have to communicate. There needs to be this knowledge transfer across from one organisation to the other, because they're very much in, you know, no longer there's this independence. Uh, the, especially at a time of uh, national stress or national um, incidents, that communication must be key. And the earlier that starts, the better it becomes, the greater understanding and the, the ability to react in a way that's properly uh, sort of understood and therefore delivered is far more essential. And, and that also comes back to the educational aspect. You know, having people who have specialised in Rome for 24 years they'll have a fantastic knowledge but also they need to know how to interact with the rest of the the organizations that are out there that's a splendid answer mark i think that actually prompted me to come to another question onto that i know the whole success story of cdbb is about connected ecosystem of digital twin and uh, not at a system level not at a city level but at a country level so uh, uh and then you have there is a part of an academy coming in, there is part of an industry coming in. But to actually polarize them all together or you know, bring them all together as a consortium, what was the role Bentley as an industry leader play? And what do you think that we could do it again in Australia? Very simple. I mean, we were there to support Alexandra and, and Mark Enzo from McDonald. 
and the rest of the team, their leadership. Yeah, as I said, the one thing you 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 know, Australia at the moment, uh, having only been here just over a week, I'm already extremely envious of the opportunities you have. You've got some fantastic projects, fantastic pipeline of projects, but also some fantastic leadership. Uh, I'd be able for one just to, to name them, the Cross River Rail team uh, up in Brisbane. Yeah, they really are running an exemplar project, well thought out from, from start to finish and beyond now. As you think they started off, the Olympics wasn't on the table. Now it is right. on the table. So the way they have uh, adapted. So what Bentley did is, is get behind uh, and support that leadership. And that's your comment earlier, is, yeah, that around a national team working in what Alexandra and the team at CDBB did, which I think was essential as a, as a kickoff and what I believe uh, you as a country need to do, is they brought, as Alexandra said, 75 of us together. You know, we all compete against each other. We all, you know, sit on the on the, the playing field, to, to use that acronym. Um, but what we did is we all learned to use the same wording, the same mindset. So no matter who we were speaking to, client, finance, insurance, um, delivery partner, the wording was the same. So there was no confusion. My, you know, what you have going on in Australia, my only concern is this is so many bright lights, but the bright lights uh, are so far away. I mean, I think one journey from, uh, you know, as you call it, a, a small road trip is about the same size as yeah. the UK. Um, you know, that communication, that soft communication is essential to be able to create yourself a natural, a natural national forum. Thank you for that. And uh, I'm going to pick, pick one word from that. You talked about insurance and finance, and then and uh, Alexandra very nicely talked about the kind of over overexposure of insurance industry because of the natural disaster that happened on, mm. which had an effect on their performance, financial performance as well as the mm. uh, you know ecological and environmental performance into that. So I know in in UK CDBB will be working along with creating a digital twin for ESG funding. I mean, I know there are projects where people go to the ESG, go to the finance industry for taking an ESG based loan, which is possibly a market that is developing on. And mm -hmm. Mark, you will having specialized on bringing that profitability into that whole, uh, uh, what do you call, uh, whole concept of building a digital twin. There has to be a purpose, there has to be a profit. And so uh, my, my question here is that is it was since the CDBB program was first introduced in 2017, there has been a step change in the quality of discussion between industry and academia and the owner operator and public sector. These conversations have created a better understanding of the use cases of benefits of the digital twin in the infrastructure. My question to you is that. Can the same be said for the discussion between the infra industry and the investor, insurers, banks, and other institutions who provide funding and finance? The short answer is yes, and it, it's it's coming very much to the forefront now, quicker than we envisaged, uh, which is which is really interesting. Uh, one of the, the the last papers we did uh, for CDB was myself, Alexandra, Alexandra, and the. A gentleman called Peter uh, Alhab, who is now working for KPMG. And we sat down and uh, produced a, a paper on the use of digital twins by the financial industry for a greater good. And we originally set the minds, the, the goal of interviewing 20 financial investors globally, by the way, these aren't just UK ones. Uh, we ended up interviewing 35 because the banks were actually reaching out to us. And it's for them, I, having come from the financial sector or worked in the financial sector, had already a, a well-established mindset of it's about risk, it's about liability, it's about reducing those. And I got caught slightly off guard. Now, I'll give you that as a, as a the third reason at the end, but the, the risk and liability with the, and if you can have sort of data will never let you predict the future. Anyone who says that, I, I'd like to have a very 
long conversation with, but what it will help you do is actually soften out the peaks and troughs. You can see where the anomalies are, you can see where the changes are, and therefore you're, you're better prepared for what's coming down the road. So that was the bank's driver. Risk liability, and I can give you some examples from the paper. One was a um, property developer in London. They borrowed 450 million from four banks. Uh, the interest rate at the time was 0.5%, obviously base rate, and their interest rate was 0.9. They got a reduction, a substantial reduction on that interest rate by being able to provide the investor um, a, a, a greater foresight of asset data that also also reduced their insurance premiums. So therefore, it reduced the bank's risk and liability. Okay. But the, the third section where it got really in, in, uh, interesting is your average investment period for a bank is three to five years. Um, in an asset, vertical asset, is normally a lifespan of 60 years. So there's you know a decent amount of change, but not a great deal of change. When you're looking at an infrastructure project, that changes completely. It's now 125 years, 150 years. So the investment period becomes longer. So in theory, they may invest more often in that. So the bit I said earlier that caught me slightly off guard was their transactional approach. They want to be able to invest in and get out as quickly as possible as their business model changes, the, the market changes. And that, no matter how much you love the project you're working on, you know, the, the blood, sweat and tears you put into it, you're still a line in, in the investment. Uh, you're just a, a simple line. And therefore, you know, we need to accommodate that. So there's two good things there. One, if we get it right, the investment market sees this as far more attractive to invest in. And the investment market is, is looking extremely uh, more in depth at infrastructure. You've got uh, two UK uh, pension companies have just put 10 yeah. billion in each into uh, UK investment in infrastructure at the earliest stages possible. So therefore, the more we can learn, develop, enhance our skill set to provide that information, the more we come in, the more money comes in, the bigger the jobs, the greater the jobs. But also, the, this is, again, it's growing of us as individuals because now there's new skill sets, new jobs required. For, for our industries to provide uh, tutelage, education, experience around, um, you know, for that sort of change in criteria to become a greater uh, ecosystem of, of community, uh, community communication. Absolutely, that'd be, that'd be thinking about things like that. And coming back to you quickly on this, is about uh, moving to research based opportunities. CDB has got some use cases and fluent cases across. I mean, I'm slightly uh, tempted toward being, you know, partial toward Bentley. I know there was a research project on West Cambridge campus digital twin. So, in the whole process of a digital twin, uh, uh, you know, policy making at national level, what could be the opportunities the academy has? You know, Australia is known for at least about a dozen universities which are very, very deeply interested in global level research work on. So related to data, related to digital twin, like what you did at uh, West Cambridge Digital Twin Campus, what are the opportunities of audience and then uh, the general learning ecosystem in Australia can look forward to that? So there were huge opportunities. The West Cambridge campus was looking at the, it's it's part of the university's campus and a number of buildings from residential through to academic buildings, through to labs, through to, um, there's even a nursery there and some canteens. So connecting those buildings and that they're not, there are a few old buildings, there are a few new buildings, and but there are buildings that have been there for the last 10, 20, 30 years. So it's not just new, it's also um, existing stock. Connecting them together, Working out, you know, how how the energy flows through, what the transport links are, how people flow through. But the thing was really interesting was that it wasn't just a technical um, study. We needed to engage with the people who are living and working there, and to understand their concerns around privacy, to understand what what of their data they were happy to be shared and, and what they were not happy to be shared. So it was like the program itself. It was a socio-technical research program. There are huge 
areas that just haven't really been looked at before because we haven't had the technology. As the technology evolves, it produces not just more technical areas to look at, but more social science areas to look at, but more legal areas to look at. So it's vital that we bring in researchers from many disciplines to work on these problems. We can't do it in silos. We need to think as academics, just because we can do something, should we do something? And that's where the social scientists will help us. So actually, it's a really exciting time to be involved in this field because I can't think of anything else that brings in such a mix of skills to solve the problem. The, the impact that I was just making some notes here, uh, the impact that digital twins will now have uh, on our on our life. Not let's just be really open here because you know, as hopefully we explained earlier, we are, and as Alexandra listed, the number of people now going to be working on our industry, which are non-traditional construction jobs, is going to explode, which I personally hope and believe is going to make our industry more attractive. Now we've, we've got a skills problem, we have a recruitment problem, and by actually not being that traditional, those, those traditional roles, by the way, are not going to go away. Your, your plumber, your, your electrician, your plasterer, they are essential people for delivering and they're not going to go and we need to get behind those people and support and recruit for them. But also what we may also do is actually grow the pie and have people who had traditionally not thought about coming into construction because the attractive roles and you know it, it's going to have that impact on i started off as you said crossrail when i started off on crossrail the iphone wasn't invented so that gives you a my age but also b how technology has blossomed uh, and you know you're going to see in, in the not so far term when you're buying your new house or you're buying the house, there's either possibly going to be a digital twin, there's going to be uh, data around the connectivity speed and all that. And and the influence the twin or that data collection is going to have on you and your general life is back in the UK. Nowadays, you, know, you can get a life insurance policy and with the life insurance oh. policy, you get a free digital Apple Watch, others are uh, available, and they set you a goal. If you hit a number of steps, you get the watch for free. If you don't hit a number of steps. So that's the technology they're being used because if you are fit, healthy, and part of, I, I don't have it, but I, I believe part of the package is reduced gym membership and the like. So therefore, if you're healthy and sensible, you become a lower risk for the insurance company and therefore you know they're willing to pass that on to yourself um but really is in, in interesting as well that same insurance company also includes an investment on so you're going to get it at both ends the investment at early stage and then during the life of the asset or the life of the individual you're going to have that ability to model your own personal digital twin yeah i think i think electron Concentration very clearly talked about profitability, is, uh, you know, shareholder pricing, but then nationally looking at GDP when globally every country is now absolutely reeling under the pressure of GDP growth after the pandemic. So it makes a compulsive story. The next question comes from an audience, Dr. Cristobal. Cristobal has been a great friend of mine. He's, a, he's, he's from Swinburne University, researching very strongly on digital twin more into advanced manufacturing space. Thank you, Dr. Chris, for joining in there. The question is to you, though he has addressed you to Alexandra, because his question is about, thank you, Alexandra, for prior presentation is what he says. And then at the moment, academia is on board with the innovation of DD technology and novel applications. Industry in general is transforming itself to better adopt and adapt themselves. However, without a proper government I'm sorry, the question moved on. Somebody else. <laughs> uh, without a proper government push or proper legislation, we find it challenging to create a better implementation. So Mark, I think you have taken that as a as a you know role to look at how do I influence government and then how do I convince them. So his question is how can government be brought into the conversation? and help become a partner and push. Do you, so, do you want to go so on? I would say this is about leadership. It's it's back to that leadership question again. It's in, industry will do what industry needs to do, and if, if we don't have leadership, we may find that it becomes fragmented. Academia needs to be brought together with industry so we can 
understand that what are the problems on the ground and how can academics help support those solutions. But the policymakers in the middle are vital. You can't just have industry and academia, you need to have the policymakers. So we need to make sure that there's the communication, as Mark said, vital, that they're informed, that they understand this isn't about a tech, this is about helping them with the big challenges that they have. And this is one of the tools in our toolbox to allow them to create the outcomes that they need for those challenges. So that leadership, that boundary spanning visionary leadership, what you need to bring that together, and that will help not just inform politicians, policymakers, but inform academia and industry about where this needs to go, where it could go and how we can work together to make it happen. Yeah. Because there's one bit I'd, I'd, I'd add to that, I totally agree. You need you need all three legs. Uh, that makes sense. Fact, but you, you do need all three sides of the, uh, of the triangle there to, to pull together. But there's also other levels you can get involved with. Um, I worked, as I said, on, on Crossrail 18, and basically 18 worked is anybody, any company uh, part of the the program was asked to uh, invest in innovation, and for every amount of money they put in, it was doubled by the client by government. Therefore, that innovation money that went in sat on the company's bottom line, and the company wanted to see what they were getting for that investment, yeah. uh, which then actually helped drive the adoption, helped drive the innovation to the market. And when the delivery team started using it and actually saw the benefit it had, it then filtered out of the project and into smaller projects or, or other divisions with inside. And then there was a reluctance to give it up. You know, construction globally is known for you know, being a high risk uh, industry with a, a very small margin. And therefore, anything that helps secure that margin was very, very welcomely received by all parties. So you could do that at project level, you can do that at city level, you can do that at state level, and you can do that at, at national level. And therefore, if you are still looking for buy-in in one of those levels, uh, uh, you know, like a, a national leadership team, you can still don't don't think you have to wait for that to happen. You know, good forthright right. and forward thinking clients can say, actually, we're going to drive innovation here and it will be a catalyst to drive out. So everybody can make the difference that they need to make. I think I think taking on the point of forward thinking, Dr. Chris, uh, I think an organization like Bentley investing into forming a very high leadership team, you know, Mark also the one who was leading the policy and advocacy one, which is a clear indication that the industry has understood that it has to be a proactive action rather than waiting for a government reactive action to take the leadership across and you know take them through an education process, awareness process of what it can bring. So that one case. And it is not all gloom as for Dr. Chris, because I can at least know, though it is at the regional level, Mark always asked me a question why is it not a national level? I don't have an answer. There are places like Canberra where the government is putting money for a digital hub, for a digital twin, and then you know CSIRO is now putting money into that. So government is willing to invest it on, but then I think an academia and industry coming together, bring our leadership, you know, approach to that, and then proactively reach out to them and understand what their anxieties are. Then we should be able to possibly get there. And uh, a good question, Chris, and then. We have another uh, another lady who's uh, uh, Gopika who's been a very strong Bentley user, and right now she is working in spec. Thank you, Gopika, for joining in. Uh, amazing talk, Alex and Mark. Uh, uh, I work in the circular economy space, and I see a lot of parallels with the ecosystem of connected digital twin and the Gemini principle. I would love to hear your thoughts on this, please. So the circular economy is one of these things that we have to do if we're going to solve those challenges on that slide. And digital twins is absolutely one of the tools that can allow us to do that because it allows us to know um, what something is, how it's been used, what's happened to it over its lifetime. And when you're designing it and building it, you need to be thinking about what will happen when you decommission it. Mark has a great phrase, which is not designed to construct, but designed to deconstruct. But actually, it's designed for the circular economy so we can put it back in. Right. So digital right. twins are, are a, a vital tool. They're not the only thing that needs to happen, but we need to get them used because we have to enable the circular economy. 
But it's it's that reuse of an asset. As Alexander, it's a project I've just picked up, and I'd, I'd love to hear other people's opinions on it. About and what I mean by design to deconstruct, you, we are looking now to be as carbon neutral as possible, and if possible, carbon positive. So taking the old traditional ways of working, you know, taking steel and concrete, which are not, shall we say, friendly to the planet in any way, shape or form, and, and encasing them, encasing one in the other, it makes life difficult. But actually, it's how we design that actually gives a second, third or fourth use of a building. You know, we've seen now with, with what's happened with COVID, the, the change in our working environment. You know, the return to the office has not been... Uh, as buoyant as, as we originally thought. We've got used to working from home. I personally have gained between three and four hours commute back per day. So, you know, it, it's life changing. So therefore you look at how do you turn an office block into a residential block, into a hospital? You know, you know where do we give additional life to an asset instead of tearing it down and starting all over again? That is my challenge to the consultancy market about it. And the, the best example I can give you is what COVID did or a drive is you know, in hospitals in the UK, we used to bury all the pipework inside the wall for cleanliness. So mopping and everything was fine. You know, along comes COVID and now we need bigger wards, better ventilation. We can't take the walls down because the pipe works. So in fact, we, the design inhibits what we're trying to do because we have less people in the ward because of that, that sort of uh, space between people. Now, if we design the hospital, should we do it with a partition wall, face fix, plumbing, face fix? So actually, if we do need to do any alterations, we're not tearing the core out, we're just in adaptive and, and more forward thinking. So things like that, I'm really keen to see how we change an internal facade or internal heart to meet the external facade. I mean, I should say that Gopi Kachyap graduated as a master's uh, student last year, and then she's into her first year job now. She's thinking about circularity and circular economy, thinking about carbon footprint. I'm sure the world is in a better place with the younger generation of engineers coming into us. Good question, Gopika. Thank you for that. Related to that, circular economy is all about CHG and then carbon footprint. And there is a lot of pushback from the, the private, you know, the industry people about the cost of it to have a design, ESG based design. So they are looking for investors and low. And I know there has been uh, CDDB has done, uh, CD, CDDB has done some work on digital twin for the finance side and ESG loan. So, can you throw a little light on that, Mark? About how does it work? Uh, I mean, how? I mean, the statement I would actually say is, um, oh, you've heard the comments already. It, it's the cost of not doing it and the the impact it can have on a, on a region uh, by not doing it. As you see, you know, there's better better terms i think is the polite way of putting it for, for people looking at funds and long term for having that data so by not having it you are going to be penalized but also it's the, the short-sightedness and, and uh, so sort of, you know that sort of i'm going to put a digital twin in it's going to cost me x and the roi is going to be y okay. the mindset is really about a project that cost has to be covered by a particular project and where the ROA might not be as as fantastic as the client or the delivery team feel it's going to be there. What they're missing out is then the forward opportunities. So yes, it might cost X and the saving might be Y. On the next job, it'll actually be Y plus Z. On the next job, it's Y plus Z plus A. So if the twin cost a million pound and the saving was quarter of a million pound, that's on one job. But when you multiply that by the 10 next jobs, that not are just road or rail, that learning of interaction of materials, people, okay. you know, you could be saving 10 times the original cost by doing the twin because of that connective foresight and not that project silo site. So that's where people to and it needs to be the government or needs to be a client or needs to be an investor that need to really stand back and look at the, the, the landscape going forward and not on that one project you're trying to deliver. 
Yeah, I mean, I, I can promise you, I've been traveling with these two legends for the last one week, but uh, your questions are so insightful that I'm getting to see a new, new, a new dimension from these two. Thank you for the question. There's one more question from uh, uh, a lecturer from Winburne University. Winburne University is possibly in the top 25 here. Sagi, so thank you for the question. Thank you all for wonderful insight on this important digital innovation through leadership initiatives. You thought on how it can be made possible to have a mandate from the Australian government, like how you achieved with the UK government, to make the digital innovation possible. What are you saying that your thoughts on how do we push the government to have a mandate? Can I hand that to you? Have that experience? Yeah. So we were CWV was actually created um, after the mandate, so I can't take any credit for that. It was others who came before us who who put that in place. It was very useful because at that stage, BIM was not being used greatly in the industry. So it because you had to use BIM on publicly procured projects, it made the industry learn about BIM, um, develop the skills and expertise, and then realise what benefit it was for the projects, for the people using the assets afterwards, and for the people procuring as well. Um, but it does come down to communication. So while, while the mandate was really useful, Australia is not in the same situation that we were. BIM, BIM is a very much a, a process and a, a set of technologies that's understood and used. Um, what needs to happen is the support of industry to adopt those technologies. It might be through a BIM yeah, mandate. Right. And again, that will be through communication, uh, talking with the policymakers, um, showing them what the benefits are, both financially, and there will come a time when they're going to have to have um, information modelling, whether that's BIM or digital twins on their projects. And I think that time is, if it's not here already, it's very close. But also the, the benefits for them that they will get those better outcomes, they will be able to track the projects and get you know greener, faster, quicker, nicer wow. results at the end. I think the one thing the 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 mandate did do, and I'm going to put my head in the in the noose here, and I, 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 please do correct me, anybody online, but I believe the mandate in the UK drove not only the digital adoption. I think BIM in the UK is about 77, 78 percent of projects, and I believe here in Australia it is down as low as 33 percent. So there is a substantial difference between the two. You know, we, we all deliver the same projects. We all deliver them in the same you know, similar ways. We are all of the same mindset. So there is obviously influence there between non-mandating and mandating. And you know, 30 to 70 is quite a substantial difference. I think there's a much more company care. I don't know, 18% uh, of the GDP investment in Australia is toward the infrastructure project. Whereas I think the number is slightly less than in UK. Mm. So and uh, uh, and the supply chain we made a challenge because of the size of our continent. Also, a company in K. So all of them are putting together. That, uh, 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 you know, we can keep going on. I'm 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 so happy that this actually became a kind of a personal conversation between. So, but one clear benefit of digital twin I can see is that. I had more than 120 people who were expected to sign in, but then some reason there are not 120 were able to sign in. But then because of our digitalization, because the the data of what you spoke is available in the visualization, visual video form, those people who didn't sign are not going to miss out. So this is a clear benefit of a digital twin coming across the web. Oh, I missed that conversation that day. I couldn't sign in. My internet didn't work. I had a lecture class. But do they miss now because digital twin helps you to reinvent it them because you're not in the physical world, but then you can go back into the cyber world and watch it. So what I mean to all the all the audience, thank you for coming in. For the people who didn't come in, we'll have the recorded version being sent to you personally for yourself. Plus, I'm taking liberty to request Alexander and Mark that any person, any guidance, because they are uh, you know an embodiment of wisdom, experience, and knowledge onto that. So Anything you do with digital twin, anything you do about, you know, purpose of digital twin outcome, feel free to write to them. I will also follow that with an email to them because the whole Bentley education objective is here is about, about creating that awareness, thought leadership, inspiring, provoking you to think onto that line. I hope we achieved it. So let's all put a huge hand together to Alexandra for, first of all, making it all the way from there. 
and to Marco for sharing all your experience in that clearly directing thing that the government has to be a part of the body and they come across. So, so and to all of your audience, without you, this would not have happened. And Adil for putting together technically. Thank you so much. We look forward to you guys. Yeah. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. Uh, feel free to le reach out to both of us on yeah. LinkedIn. More than happy to take any questions. Thank you. Appreciate that. Thanks. Thank you. We sign off with that and then look forward to you again sometime. Thank you. Thank you.